Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. This is episode number 126. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined today by a very special guest, game developer, writer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Luke Bernard. Luke, thank you for joining me today. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good. Thank you. All right. So I was, I asked you something before we began and I wanted to get further into this, although I already know the answer. Were you at PSX in PlayStation Experience in 2014? 2015, I've, something like that, with a Vita I've, game? I've been to every single PlayStation experience yeah. when they were still doing them. Right, okay. I think there was a time where I met you, um, and I don't blame you for not remembering because you meet a million people at these things, but I remember meeting you because I think I played one of your Vita games, and uh, I remember thinking you were an interesting guy, and I was thinking that in my mind because we, we talk online, but I really mm. don't see you, and then when I saw you on the screen, I was like, oh shit, that is the, it is the person. So we have met, but I don't, blame you for not remembering in the past and i think it was when i was still at ign so a long time ago that's kind of funny because I, i've actually been following you since the ign day so it makes it even funny that i don't remember yeah, meeting. It's, it's all good um luke i wanted to invite you on today you and i've been talking behind the scenes about some different stuff but you're doing this really interesting game uh that i wanted to bring to the attention of our audience uh, it's called the light in the darkness and it's about the holocaust and our audience knows we like to take game. We're very silly and stupid on the show, but we like to take games seriously. We like serious games. We like serious subject matter. And I had to talk to you about this project because for, for multiple reasons, I'm really curious about it. Uh, as we, you and I have discussed in the past, I'm from Long Island, which is one of the most Jewish places in the entire world. Um, and so I, I've always, always said uh, I kind of culturally feel Jewish. I certainly feel uh, kin to Jewish people having grown up around so many of them. Um, and in fact, I was watching the Jets game yesterday with my girlfriend and she noted that people in the audience had like Jets yarmulkes on. And I was like, <laughs> yes, that's where I grew, that's that's where I grew up. So I really wanted to get your take on this game and what you're doing and how the industry is taking it and how it came to be and all that. So before I get into all of that, though, you have a pretty um, illustrious career of games, uh, d directing, producing, etc. So can you introduce everyone to just who you are, what you've made? They may have played some of your games specifically because we have such a Vita audience yeah. on here that they definitely have probably encountered your stuff before so talk to us a little bit about who you are and then we'll get into the rest of it uh so so i, so I guess basic i've been in the industry for a while like maybe over a decade now so i basically i released one of the first games on steam my first game was honestly i don't know can i curse yeah it's you can curse. Of, uh, okay yeah. it's just checking yeah. it was honestly a load of shit it was, but I was 21, you know, so what do you expect with your first game? And from there, I kind of, you know, jumped onto mobile, all those things, and then eventually I ended up on the Vita I did. So I, I think, actually, funny enough, last week, last Friday, we released our last Vita games, which were Skull Pirates and War Theater Blood of Winter, which were both kind of exclusive, only physical, so we didn't release any digital versions of them. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so for the past 10 years, I guess I've been like independent in the gaming industry. Like I've never had to work for a big company. I've, I've worked with publishers. Sometimes I have, but most of my career, like I've never had to actually go and work inside the studio. So I've actually been quite uh, lucky in that regard. Sure. I have. And I think, um, yeah, I remember like we were one of the most, uh, you know, biggest advocates for the Vita, you know, back in the day. I even remember Tane Sony, like, hey, I, actually, funny enough, once um, I was at, so Sony back in the PSX days, it was, or PSX, so I think it was, yeah, it was June 1 E3. They put me next to Andrew House at dinner, pretty much. And I was kind of, you know, all the developers will be like, Andrew House, we love you, do, 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 all those things. And I was just telling Andrew, I was being like, what the fuck did you do to the Vita? What the fuck did you do to the PSTV? <laughs> these are these are great questions. Well, because I was being like, you have the PSTV, it's too expensive. It doesn't come with a controller. Like you have PS now, you could be like, this could be so big. And he was actually telling me, he's no longer at Sony, so I don't think I can get in trouble anymore. Um, he was telling me basically like he, he'd been fighting for those things, but he, he couldn't get anything done with the board, which was, really honest answer funny yeah. enough because 
I still believe, I mean, everyone knows this pretty much because it's been leaked. Like on some dev kits of the Vita, you can pretty much hook it up to your TV. I was like, the Vita could have been the Switch before the Switch. And I listen, that platform, I mean, I remember like one of my favorite platforms has always been the PSP. And I remember the games on it. And I was just like, you know, if you just had PSP even quality games on the Vita, I mean, yeah, the Vita was just such, such a magnificent machine. It's such a shame that, you know, Sony did, just could have reduced the price. And, you know, I did control it to PS TV and or, or just released a version where you can hook up to the TV. And I think they would have, you know, it would have been the Switch before the Switch. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally, um, we're totally in the same, on the uh, same page there. And you're right. I have a Vita dev kit now because from, for the, the studio I work for, but what, back in the day when I used to get games like at IGN, they used to at, literally have to come in with the HDMI enabled Vita because for some reason that was just not allowed. Uh, and, you know, to have in anyone's hands, it was just fucking obnoxious. But, but um, can, yeah. can you believe it? Pretty much behind the scenes, they had a killer device that they refused to release commercially. It's absolutely bonkers. When you yeah, it's, it, it's, it's obnoxious uh, and absurd. But uh, yeah, I miss it. I still play it all the time. But Luke, so and I think the game I, I first played of yours that I was familiar with, I think was Desert Ashes. Um, and uh, yeah, I like like. First of all, I like the aesthetic of your games, although it's changed now. The aesthetic of the game we're going to talk about today is very different. But there's something, you know, I, I co-own the studio Lilymo and we're making, you know, a bunch of small games and trying to give them a little bit of an identity. And I always felt like you had a kind of consistent identity in your games, which which I thought was really neat. I think that's what makes this newer game, um, you know, shine so much more. So I'm wondering, I, I saw I was reading about you a little bit. I want you to clarify this. So. What is Voices of the Forgotten? This is like a this is an organization, right? Then underneath that, the light and the darkness is kind of one of the projects you're you're going so, for, right? So basically, Voices of the Forgotten is a nonprofit which I created this year, and at first it was just to kind of you know do Holocaust education, kind of all those things, form of video games, things like that. Uh, but it kind of shaped in something uh, different too. It's still doing video games. But say, for example, like um, I helped basically, I organized a fundraiser uh, online via Instagram for Holocaust survivors in poverty. Then we did our first comedy show where we raised money for Holocaust survivors in poverty because in the US, a third of Holocaust survivors live in absolute poverty. Uh, there's, there's a big misconception where people think Holocaust survivors got a lot of money when it's really not the case. Reparations have honestly been an utter disaster they have. So that's where we shifted. And then also with that nonprofit too, funny enough, I also look after trying to help refugees get like status in Europe very much. So we help like a lot of uh, trans refugees get for, from Egypt pretty much over to France. I, I know that's also another weird thing which we kind of do because I kind of wanted not only to just do a video game, but also to kind of, how can I say, put my money where my mouth is at kind of thing to actually, you know, help out Holocaust survivors and also, you know, help out people who need refugee status. So it's, it's, it's a very weird thing, I guess, in the gaming industry, you know what yeah. I mean? It, it, well, <laughs> I do know what you mean. And that's what I'm, I wanted to back up a little bit. Cause one of the things I was interested in, in reading about you, you, you sent me this article on wired, which was really interesting and uh, kind of an extensive interview with you and going over a little bit of the project. And, they in there you talk a little bit about like your cognizance of the holocaust your cognizance of judaism zionism all i guess all these different things that you might touch on where that wasn't always a part of your life though right so i want i want to know like where kind of that came from and then not only how it sprouted up it became a piece of you know a point of passion for you well so basically when it, when i was a teenager this person reappeared in my family's life and it was basically one of my grandmother's sons. It was that she had lost uh, kind of in World War Two. She was in the UK, though, so she was safe. And it suddenly came out that we were Jewish. It did pretty much, which was, you know, kind of a bit of a shock. And sure. then uh, it was found out my aunt knew knew this all along. But, you know, everything was erased. My grandmother, she just changed her name nonstop to raise everything Jewish about her and her daughter. And that's, I mean, that's something that, but when I think about it now, it really 
how can I say, changed me in a lot of ways. But in the moment, I was just like, eh, whatever, you know, like kind of thing. But then after when I was a young adult, like maybe around 20, something like that, or 19, I started, you know, do my own research into the Holocaust because let's be honest, inside school, they just brought us Schindler's List, made us watch Schindler's List, and that was it. I don't right. No context or, you know, right, exactly. And, and France has some of the best education system in the world, honestly, but you, yeah, you pretty much, I have no clue. I had no clue. Oh, I didn't really know much about the Holocaust. So when I started doing all my own research, how can I say I became kind of traumatized slash really sad slash really disgusted, you know, what humans can do. And I think back during those times, you know, World War II games were such a big um, thing they were. So and I always noticed they kind of never touch upon the Holocaust. It's always pretty much very simple. It's like, I'm an American, I'm going to go shoot some Nazis. And that that's it pretty much. And I, I thought, you know, since video games kind of even back then, were kind of like future storytelling and becoming such a big industry, that we needed to also be able to talk about the Holocaust to in video games. So that's kind of where this whole project started, I guess, like 10 years ago, which was a very different project back then it was. So in your, I don't know if you want to call it like your, um, in studying the industry and seeing what others have done, was there anything that ever did broach the subject outside of, you know, the shooters maybe touching on it or something like that? Was there ever like an adventure game or anything that you, you encountered that tried to tell the story? Um, in any respect, I never found any any games. So that's un- that's see, that's unbelievable, right? Like that's that's almost that's almost that's unbelievable, right? Like that's incredible. Well, that that when I noticed when the game was announced over ten years ago, and it was a completely different game. It was uh, basically New York Times and everyone just jumped on it, and then kind of started criticizing it, not knowing the context. So I kind of you know noticed why. And, you know, industry people are reaching out to me and saying, yeah, you should do this. This is great. But, you know, how can I say people are still scared to do it and still are to this day scared to do it. They are because I I think it's also if you really fuck this up, you really fuck this up. You know what I mean? Like it's such it's such a subject where you really have to get it right. So I mean, even to this day, it's still the same thing within the industry where um people are really for it but there's still a lot of people who are very uh hesitant they are very much to um but fine enough back then it was holocaust organizations who thought i'd lost my mind and nowadays holocaust organizations think this is the right thing so that's really changed in 10 years but the industry hasn't changed in 10 years in regards to how they can view a project like this and as you've explained, I mean, this is a really good piece of insight, I think, for people that don't design games like we do and, and aren't in the more of the development world, where is it fair to say that the people that were early opponents of it within the Jewish community or whatever, it's because they didn't understand what video games were. Is it, is it fair to say that that was a big part of it? Like that they, you, I think you explain in one of your interviews that it, they thought it was Mario, like Mario and a Holocaust. And yeah. you had to kind of, so you had to educate them a little bit. Yeah, or either they assumed the worst. They either thought it was Sim City in a concentration. You know, like they just imagined the worst. But right. but now, pretty much at the Holocaust organizations, it's kind of people around I age range who get video games. So that's really what changed everything. It did, and I think I think in the gaming industry, in the gaming industry, they understand, you know, what the project is still too. But they're still. I know, very safe they are. And I, I think, how can I say, that kind of um, nearly bothers me a bit, it does, because we have so many other kind of video games, you know, with shooting Nazis, all those things, right? right? And suddenly that's okay, but telling the story of what really, uh, you know, several things happened during World War Two, but one of, you know, one of the most biggest things that happened in World War Two, and especially since I've noticed just people don't know their history, as they don't, sadly. I mean, we can notice this every day, we can. That That's why I thought, you know, this is just a very important thing to do, and that's why also I'm planning to launch it for free, 
which I think also was in the industry, you know, people really think I've lost my mind. <laughs> they have. Because, you know, because I'm coming in, I'm also saying I'm doing the first video game about the Holocaust, but I'm also coming in and saying I refuse to profit off of this. Right. Yeah, so, that is, it's remarkable. It's, uh, I, I, give, I give it a lot of, I give you a lot of credit because I know this is a weird parallel to draw, but I think you'll understand where I'm going with this. It reminds me a little bit of um, the no Russian controversy or the no Russian stuff in Call of Duty, wherein something very controversial happens. That is, in, in that case, you're gunning down an airport full of civilians, right? And mm -hmm. it's the natural consequence of what you do in the game. You just never see this part of it. And I love, so I draw that comparison because I love what you're saying here, where this is all, this is all happening as background radiation when we're at, when we're at Market Garden, when we're on Normandy, when we're crossing the Rhine and doing all these things, all of this is still happening right up through the spring of 1945. And so it's a really nice point to say, like, why wouldn't we be able to talk about this? And I have to say too, you were joking about it, but like Sim City in uh, like in a concentration camp where I'm like, it would be interesting to get further into the, you don't want to call it the economy or anything, but in another game where it's like, how did they survive? How did they make their lives better? How did they improve? You know, there's like a bunch of different ways to explore it. I don't hate that idea, but I, you know what I love about your idea the most, and this is where I want to get into the light and the darkness is this was the most fascinating thing, Luke, that I, I read about it. In my opinion was as a game mechanic, as a as a choice, you removed any choice in the game. <laughs> and so and and basically your thought about this is and I'll let you expand on it is they had no choice in this situation. Jews had no choice in Nazi Germany. They had no choice in a concentration camp. They had no choice in a ghetto. So talk to me a little bit about because you said the game started in you know, differently than it is now. And it's, it's coming out next year in 2022. Talk to me a little bit about how, how it changed and how you kind of got to the gameplay mechanics and, and what you would, I guess, describe as a respectful and cogent fashion. So I would say before, it was still always planned to be a kind of adventure game and all those things. But before, I didn't really have any kind of support from researchers or survivors. And the different, big difference is now pretty much like the story was co-written with a survivor, Holocaust survivor, and also researchers. So everything was in the story, even if it's the family is a fictional family. Everything that happens within the story is based on truth. It is so pretty much it comes from different testimonies because I wanted to tell a particular story. I did, and you know, it's kind of, it's very hard to find. You know that story you need to tell I me. Mean, Schindler's List just managed to do it so well to be able to cover so many different aspects of the Holocaust. So I decided to make, you know, write a story based on so many different testimonies. Like I, I'll give you an example. There's, um, there's a scene like in the video game where basically you have to go register the police as a Jew, you do. And uh, the policeman pretty much tells you, hey, you're going to get rounded up, you know, on this day. And that happened to a survivor who I work with, who's mother pretty much the policeman told her mother you're going to get rounded up you need to get the fuck out pretty much and that policeman pretty much saved their lives so it's so many different things mm. kind of like that everything kind of in the game plus the dates you know we're showing the dates hey this happened on this day because we're also we're not just jumping straight into the holocaust we're jumping into their lives before we're showing you know how everything changed bit by bit and also since it's set in france and, you know, most things in, in the Holocaust uh, media projects are set in Poland or things like that. Most people don't realize in France, it was the French that rounded up the Jews. It wasn't the Germans. It was the, the Vichy. French yeah, Vichy government. Right. <clears throat> and uh, so that was one big thing, which I also, because I'm French, even if I sound British, I, I know it's complicated. <laughs> I... That's one thing which I really wanted to kind of tell because we've often really ignored a lot what happened in France. And I think it also has hurt Holocaust survivors in terms of reparations. So the Jews who were in France in general, who were Polish Jews who had immigrated, most of them have received like zero dollars in reparations they have because, you know, because of the Holocaust being done in France. I wanted to bring more attention to kind of that aspect of it because we also... We always do this thing of basically Nazis bad. You know, we make it very simple. Nazis bad guys. The end. 
But the Holocaust was not simple like that. The people that rounded up the Jews, the people that hated the Jews, were normal people. It could happen to a society like today. It could. It could happen to any other country. Like, these were normal people. That's what people really need to understand. Because at first, for example, in the game before, the Nazis, because there's some Nazis in the game, so the Nazis, I decided to represent them as shadowy figures, but I had this advisors who's from uh, one of the Holocaust museums, and he told me, and this really stuck with me, he said, don't represent them as shadows or monsters on artistic take, take represent them as humans, mm. because it was humans that did this. Yes. And that really, how can I say, stuck with me. Now, that's why I think it's good to show what happened in France, because, again, in France, everyone was really integrated the Jews, like the family who are in the game, they're not super religious, they're kind of a bit secular as they are. But in the Holocaust, it, you know, a lot of people miss some things, often think it was a religious thing. It's like, no, Nazis just went after Jews, no matter if you were religious or not. Because uh, as we know, pretty much, a lot of Jews in general are kind of secular. <laughs> they are. You right. Know? Well, and that's the double edged sword of being Jewish, right, is that it's a it's the rare religion that is also a culture and a people right it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting and, yeah yeah and also yeah. An, an ethnic group it is so mm -hmm. a lot of people right. don't re don't realize you know because it could even me myself after i ended up doing a dna test and all those things that i did and i was like oh wait i'm jewish and nordic okay and spanish well that's weird um so yeah you're a mutt yeah <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah, that's what i researched uh, yeah, yeah I, I researched that. I think the Nazis would have called me like a half breed or something like that. They would have, um, which is still not great. Uh, but so, yeah, that, that's what I'm really trying to kind of educate. And I think the, the writer who wrote the Ward piece, right? Why Ward picked it up is because they kind of viewed this game as an anti racist game. And I know a lot of people might be like, but they were white, the Jews. So it's not, you know, it's not a. You know, they can't understand, it seems like, in America. But all genocides, every single one, was often done on people the same skin color it was, very much. And that's one thing which I've, you know, because I started studying so many different genocides, after the you know, Bosnian genocide, Cambodian, Armenian, R I started. Rwanda would be another. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah you're, you're, it's actually an really interesting point. I never, never even thought of that. You know, it's not truly the other. The other those around them it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's yeah. kind of like the different ethnic group it is right. pretty much it's, it's never it's it's not based on skin color it is, it's a different kind of racism it is which i don't know if america understands that racism yet because you know back in europe it's yeah again it's a very different kind of racism it is like right. which well it's why how the really, nazis looked at the slavs compare and the russians yeah. compared to the british even though they're all white you know, they've looked at the Slavs as being basically, you know, subhuman. Um, and so you're totally it's right. And, it's, and, and it is in the United States. The only reason I know, I mean, I studied history was what I majored in college, American history. But um, it's not taught well in the secondary system here. And so God, God only knows if anyone even knows when the Holocaust occurred at, in public school, nonetheless. Uh, well, what I've uh, noticed yeah. very interesting is that when I go out and just talk to people that a lot of people in America, they either think there's no more Holocaust survivors left or they think it was done so long ago. And I'm like, it was, you know, what, 76 years ago that it ended? Yep. And it never really ended. Mm. Like, after it, there were still pogroms going on, like, you know, in Poland. Like, you can't just get the hate out of people just right away. It wasn't just suddenly they defeated the Nazis and everyone loved Jews. They still hated Jews, they did. So it kind of never went went away. And then it, the ideology just kind of started spreading to all those of other countries that did. And that's what's something which I find also very fascinating, which we never talk much about, is the aftermath of the Holocaust too, how that was also one big giant disaster also. So talk to me about, we, we mentioned a little bit, you know, this this game takes place in the, the Western Front, which is kind of weird, where most of the concentration camps and rampant anti-Semitism was more in the Eastern theater, um, although everywhere it was happening. But I like your focus on this, especially because it kind of inverts what we usually see in World War II with a hyper focus militarily on Normandy and Benelux and all of that. And then not much of a worry about what's going on in the Soviet Union, even though that's 
crazy stuff, but then we're worried much more about the social implications over there as opposed to over here. So I like the the transfic the the, uh, the uh, switching places between those two things, which is awesome. But you had mentioned a family and all of that. Can you tell us a little bit about the the, the core plot of the game without, I guess, giving away too much? So the core plot is really about um, a Polish Jewish immigrant family in France. It is during the Holocaust, so you really get to experience the beginning of the game, kind of how everything's normal. And as time goes on, you know, as more laws get passed, as German occupies France, for those things to be she government, you get to kind of see every single step uh, as a player as to what happens pretty much like in the game. And I will say compared to other Holocaust, let's say Hollywood films, right? Where in general, they have a happy ending where I'm really sticking to a more realistic ending, I am. So without spoiling anything, I can just say it's not going to be a good ending. It, it isn't. But also what's interesting with the game too, I only plan to have it to be around two hours long maybe because I kind of want people to be able to play it and <clears throat> finish it in a sit, you know, in one go in a sitting right. very much because I don't want people, you know, because games are so long nowadays. I don't want yeah, people to have to spend 40, 100 hours, you know. I want them to be able to play it and then after to kind of be a bit curious more about the Holocaust. So I've I've also told people too, I'm like, I'm not here to come and like, I'm, I'm not here to educate everyone, but what I'm here to do with this game is to bring the conversation about it again and also to get people curious to kind of learn more after. That's, I love that. And, you know, one of the things you had described earlier, which I especially love, and I know you mentioned this in our correspondence as well, was as opposed to avoiding the realities of the situation, you're putting your shoulder in and going right into it, including with the use of Nazism itself, Nazis, the swastika and all of that. And one thing you and I were discussing was something I had really noticed and been really confused by, which was the kind of slow erosion of the reality, the real people, as you said earlier, of Nazism, of Nazi Germany, as opposed to this symbol that kind of looks like a swastika and people that kind of look like Nazis, but it removes like the, they're just become, I think you used a really great example. They've become zombies and like Call of Duty zombies. It's, it's indistinguishable. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really loved that. Why, why do you think that is? And I know that it's really necessary for you to do this for your story, but is it? do you feel like it's dangerous to do considering expectations in the industry? So, fair enough. I've always, so me personally, I've always been against uh, players playing as Nazis, I have. And that's just from my personal kind of views, it is. But so what I've noticed kind of started, I guess, with Battlefield 5, where they started making the Nazi Germany, because they were Nazi Germany, they were, they weren't Germany, as just Germany, and then selling DLCs. So it seems like it's something to just honestly make money. That's what it seems like. And when I saw pretty much there's this new video game coming out on consoles uh, this week called Hell Let Loose. Mm. And when I saw it, Hell Let Loose also doing the same thing, compared to German Army, and then basically when you win with the German army, the Erika song plays, which is the theme which the Nazis used, but then they removed all Nazi symbols, all those things. I'm like, you're normalizing Nazis and Nazi Germany as just Germany. And that is something where I'm like, you, you can't just do that. I think this normalizes, I know it may be a controversial thing to say, I think this normalizes white supremacy. I'm talking about Nazi, you know, I'm talking about the extreme white supremacy in terms of like, hey, they were just German, you know, like, that's okay. You just make them German, just normal German people. And I'm like, even the Germans I've talked to, because one of my business partners is German, and he used to be in the military. He's just like, I, he doesn't like this either. Because, you know, you know, Germany really wants to separate from Nazi Germany. They don't. Right. And Desperately. I think, <laughs> and I, I think this is what I think is so hypocritical of the video game industry that this game, some companies consider this to be controversial, but yet they're okay with having loads of people play as Nazis without the symbols, having the Nazi theme song play and actively promoting it on their social media channels. And I think this really talks to 
I know it's also um, British comedian David Bedell, who wrote a book called Jews Don't Count. And that, I think, really resonates to me what is happening in the video game industry. Jews don't count pretty much. That a project like mine is really about what happened to the Jews in World War II, which is really important for us to actually be able to tell and educate people. You know, it doesn't get much support from some console manufacturers because the subject line, but yet they're okay promoting a game where you role play kind of as the German army and you have that Nazi song. And that's that's just a very interesting thing. And I think when we're erasing history or we're making history like, you know, whitewashing it, this is dangerous because mm. when there's no more Holocaust survivors around, you know, who knows, maybe 20 years from now, they might just be like, well, the Germans, they were just defending their land. You know, it might just turn into right. that because we're, we're giving, you know, most people don't pay attention to history class. And so, you know, they're going to see this Germans are just normal. And especially with the ADL even did this thing about hating video games. And the ADL found out that a quarter of gamers are exposed to white supremacy in games, but pretty much like Nazi white supremacy. And so with video game companies, they need to kind of think a bit more than just, how can I say, just uh, money when it comes to this, especially now we live in a time where everyone's, you know, got to be, how can I say, quote unquote, woke and like pay attention to all those things. But yet again, for Jews, it seems like, ah, who gives a shit? Well, I feel like, I feel like that's, I mean, not, I mean, I guess we have to inherently get a little political, but that's that's kind of how I feel in the real world. Like it's they're treated in the real world. <laughs> so well, it's like yeah. why, why, why wouldn't they be treated like that in entertainment? Like imagine, you know, I want peace over there, no more bloodshed or whatever. But imagine a situation where you're mad at a people for just having an, a defensive missile system that shoots like well, offensive that attacks. Like that's just to me. I just feel like it's just you're right. It's so it's so interesting. People are gonna people are going to because. What you said about like, oh, they were just protecting their land. Where where do we have that argument to, today about old things? Oh, yes. In the United States about the Civil War and you know, a, a whole generation of people, the, the, the South will rise again, the 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 old myth of the, the Confederacy and all of that, like that still prevails today, even though it's very clear why the Civil War was fought. So I love what you said there about reminding people of um, of the situation. I think it's so important. And well, um, so. Tell me a little bit about, oops, sorry, I got off the mic. Tell me a little bit about um, what kind of feedback you've gotten. You were talking a little bit about the console manufacturers and stuff. First of all, where are you releasing this game and and um, how can people play it when it comes out? I, I see on your website it's it's Q1 2022, but do you have more specifics? Yep. So I'm most likely going to delay it to Q2. I am mm. just because I want it to be the best game possible i was planning to launch it on holocaust memorial day but then i was like okay let me not try to rush it let me just release it when it's ready sure and so listen it's been approved for every single console it has pretty much but i'm more interested as of right now going with a console manufacturer for the first release that kind of gets it and supports it. So, you know, I've been talking to different console manufacturers I have, and, um, you know, there was one where they even refused to release the trailer pretty much. And the trailer, as you can see, like on my Twitter and all that, it's nothing controversial. It isn't. And they refused to release the trailer. And I was like, this makes no sense. This doesn't. You're allowing me to release it on your console, but you won't let me release the trailer. But they were giving me excuses, being like, oh, we can't tell you why. And I'm like, I know why you, you don't want to release it, because it's, you know, it got to do with the Holocaust. Right. But you're at the same time actively now promoting a video game where you get to play as Nazis. So I, what is the difference? Yeah, I was going to say, kind of Hell Let Loose is a PlayStation Plus game, so... And so lots yeah. of people are going to are going to be exposed to it. Yeah. And that's one thing which I I became kind of really baffled by. But mm. so I tell you one platform it's not coming out on, not on Steam. I, a Steam is just going to be a disaster in the comments. It is. Oh, yeah, of course. That's that's a, <laughs> yeah. OK, so I'm I can say one thing. I have been talking with Microsoft about launching it on uh, definitely on their Windows store because Epic Games haven't been getting back to me. So they're not responding to me. They aren't. Yeah. 
And so it's looking for P on the PC version for it to be only on the Microsoft uh, kind of store. And that's what, again, which is a very interesting thing, how come, you know, big platforms like Epic Games are not responding? Because, again, we plan to also have this game within schools. There's a whole pilot program already planned, and that's why, again, it, it's such a fascinating thing to kind of see. I can't expect when the game is out and, you know, and people get it that, all these big companies will be like, oh, we suddenly get it now. But, and, and that's why it's kind of, how can I say, a bit of, um, again, it's kind of really sad. It is that pretty much these platforms are okay doing history revisionist games like Nazi zombies or Nazi this or removing the Nazis. Right. But if you tell the real story of a people and we want also people to remember what happened to Jews, then it's like, oh, don't want to touch this. Kind of, even if you have huge Holocaust organizations behind it, pretty much, because that's that's the whole thing. I actually have now big organizations who are paying attention. We even like it. I mean, the claims conference even did a tweet in support of it. Claims conference, they're the group that look after all the reparations from Nazi Germany. So everyone is start, even the ADL. So everyone is starting to really be on board with this. But entertainment, it's just, and I, not going to say entertainment, but video games, it's still very, very hard. And I think it's also, there's also someone else that told me this, why a lot of people don't want to jump on board with this is because pretty much any time you talk about the Holocaust, people associate it with Israel-Palestine, which mm. is utter madness. Because I've just told people, this is the history of Europe. This has nothing to do with Israel-Palestine. And... Anytime you do anything kind of Jewish, uh, you can pretty much notice in the comments section, it turns into an all-out war. It does pretty much in with Israel-Palestine. And how can I say the Jews are the only group where, you know, if, if you look at any other group, let's say imagine you started going after Muslims in the USA for ISIS or the Taliban, right? You, you'd be shut down right away. Be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? But it's okay to go after Jews for the situation in Israel, Palestine. And that is just utter madness because, again, it really even affects Holocaust organization. I'll give you an example. I, I live right next to the Holocaust Museum in Los Angeles. And so this spring, a lot of things were going on pretty much. So I went, there was a protest. There was a pro-Palestinian protest which was happening um, in front of the Holocaust Museum. So I decided to go and attend because I was like, what's going on this sounds why are you protesting in front of a holocaust museum right exactly <laughs> like this what is happening you know yeah so i went there and it it's i mean it it, it got bad so quick it went it went with people chanting zionist are rapist and then it went with basically people hanging the israel flag with the nazi symbol on it marching in front of the holocaust museum and i was just like how can i say no one did anything no one really said much, you know, like the me there's not much things in the media or anything about this. Oh, I, and can't I was believe it. Yeah, and I was just like, I mean, there's photos, there's everything there is. And I was just like and it it, it was just so baffling, but that's basically what's happened. Mm. Where anything related to the Holocaust, it's turned into Israel Palestine it has. And I don't you know, it doesn't happen to any other group that this kind of thing, it doesn't. Yeah, it's like a conflation between the event and Zionism, which are two different things. And Zionism predates w both world wars. So it's so again, like you have this. I, I find that really interesting as well, that they can't you can't just have like a commemoration. It's like it's like it would be akin to going to the Vietnam War Memorial in the United States and having a protest about like war there. Like yeah. about no, like it's like well, this is about the people that died in another war, and you know, like this is about just a specific situation. Let's have a let's have conversations about specific situations. You have to be fucking twisted to go well, to uh, to go to the to, to to protest anything outside the Holocaust Museum. I think is a pretty twisted. And 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 that's one thing which is how can I say very because I I identify me myself as a non zionist meaning listen, the state of Israel exists. That's just a fact. It fucking exists, right? But me personally, hey, I, I don't care to live in the Middle East. Uh, I, I consider myself European and now American, so I'm I'm so secular. I don't 
give a shit. I don't very much, but I have Israeli friends. I also have Palestinian mm-hmm. friends, and mm-hmm. I love them. I do very much, and I'm just like you know. I don't want when I seen what was going on this spring. You know, I was hurting for both sides. I was really yeah. for the civilians, which were getting caught up in this, and. I, th- I think why people don't know history and why people really need to learn history is that most people ended up in Israel or most people ended up Zionist. It's not because they necessarily wanted to, it's because they had to. And so that's one big thing, like a lot of refugees out of World War II, Jews, America wasn't accepting them. European countries weren't accepting them. The only places were, which were accepting them were kind of like just to go over to Israel, but they still got put in camps, complicated thing there. And then after when Israel passed and got created, the Jews in the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, all started getting attacked, blamed for, you know, a country being formed. And guess what? They all ended up in Israel because they all got their houses burned down. They got killed. They had, again, no choice. And then we look at the 70s. The Jews of Russia, because Russia hated Israel so much, they were all, all also had to leave. While most Russian Jews were like, we can't want to go over to the US, but you know, not everyone was able to go over to the US. So that's what I think is very interesting is that anti Zionists, they didn't realize in general, they just push more Jews into Israel. Mm. Be, if, if you really, let's put it this way, if you really hate Israel that much, the best thing you can do is actually make sure Jews are safe within the country you're in. But when you're pushing them all out there, because, you know, you have to write free Palestine on their stores and all things like that, where they're just like, eh, what's this got to do with me? I'm not in a settlement. <laughs> right, no, yeah, this is, this is a, I think, a, a point that Barry Weiss also makes it. It's a great point that you by, by othering Jews throughout time, you've codified Judy, like, jewelry as it were as like this thing that is shared by people even though they don't necessarily like some of the russians you were talking about like they didn't want to leave you know like they didn't yeah. want you know it's like the long the long island jews i grew up with don't want to go to israel they go there for like to see people but they don't want to live there so that's a yeah. really wonderful that's a really wonderful point I, I i had never really heard that articulated before well it's, it's it's something that sweeped in also within the video game industry kind of this sentiment i mean I've been like, I remember because I, I sent you the tweet. I, I did very much uh, um, by since, you know, by what's his name? Ian Walker, pretty much, who just because. Walking you know, fart noise, Ian Walker. <laughs> who's over at Kotaku. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I know a lot of writers over there, uh, some which I absolutely, I love their work. I don't agree with everything Kotaku posts. In general, Ian Walker, what he posts. But, you know, I really like a lot of other writers at Kotaku. Sure. And Ian Walker, I mean, just the fact pretty much, it was another journalist that sent me his tweet where his tweet was basically like, Luke Bernard is the biggest Zionist in the gaming industry and he's harassing me. And I'm just like, you blocked me. What are you talking about? Yeah. I just call you out because every time you mention Jew, you say Zionist, you say Zionist, and you're sounding like David Duke pretty much. Like, stop using those terms and right. then when because say for example on his ps5 review which mentioned nothing about israel or anything or zionism he has to go around and, and tweet pretty much zionists are mad at me zionists are after me and i'm just like you're you're not job you need to stop this so i was just trying to explain to the editor-in-chief once just via twitter he's really crossing the line into anti-semitism and this needs to stop and instead, you know, he makes himself out to be the victim or those things. And I'm just a Zionist. But he, it can't prove my point where I'm like, yeah, that's anti-Semitism. Where you're just jumping in. I'm trying to explain to you, hey, it's a bit anti-Semitic. Stop doing that. You're a Zionist pig. It's like, well, okay, you are anti-Semitic then. So that's kind of what's happened within the video game industry. Because everyone jumped in with their opinion on Israel-Palestine this spring. And, you know, without being more informed about everything, and it just made, you know, Jews all out to be the bad guys, unless Jews are like, we hate Israel, it needs to be destroyed. And I'm like, that's not good either, guys, because those Jews have nowhere to fucking go. Right. I, 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 <laughs> that's, that is the, the point. It's like, what do you want? And um, it removes like the... I love what you said earlier too about 
like World War One and World War Two Germans and how they're kind of like the same in the games now. And I was thinking about that, like World War Two, you would think like, oh, the Germans, but it removes just that texture of even how they became Germany to Weimar to Nazi Germany and all that kind of stuff. And just the the different pieces of the puzzle that people don't learn about. So they come to these situations incredibly ignorantly and it frustrates the shit out of me personally. Well, but, yeah, if, if, if you look at Nazi Germany, why it came how it came to be it also says anti-semitism was rampant and it also was it was in the universities all those things like it wasn't just it wasn't just overnight and every time it's been anti-semitism and people are attacking jews it's it's been on the far right and the far left it, it, which is something they both have in common they do is that they both hate the jews yeah the communists well, well, the, the, the and woke... nazis both I hate I hate to say it, but the woke are racist. I mean, I don't care. I mean, I'm per, I'm not saying that that Luke feels that way. I'm saying that I think that that like the woke are racists, and in the in the biggest, you're racist. It's it's just uh, I don't know. It's just fucking weird. I I, I I don't. That's why I don't want anything to do with either of the extremes because they they seem to be very much like each other more than they would like to admit. Well, but what, I'm sorry, what's, please. What's very interesting is is again I am. I'm probably more liberal than most Americans, most American liberals. I mean, I grew up in France. You know, we have healthcare, abortion. We don't even debate on those things. We don't. So I just always starting there, I'm always more liberal. But what I just saw this year where, you know, it just people just being an anti-Semite became okay, just out there. And all these people at big companies, all these things, just being able to say, all these things, like even the most ridiculous things is when I saw going around like pretty much like people in big high positions. I mean, I remember when I saw Corey Barlog, who I love his work, but when he retweeted a video where the video was this woman singing and basically she was singing about how Holocaust survivors uh, came to Palestine to steal the land. She didn't exactly say Holocaust survivors, but she's like, you know, when the intention became clear, you know, was to steal the land. I was just like, what the fuck, man? Like, like what, what the, on earth is going on? And I remember tweeting at him and being like, do you realize what you've done? Have you lost your mind pretty much? Because this is just goes into anti-Semitism in terms of Jews trying to steal everything. Just can you fucking stop it? If you look at history, mate, they had no fucking choice. They had no choice. Like the Jews from Europe, honestly, the Israelis sp spoke all Hebrew and the Jews from Europe were kind of like, uh, what? We don't understand your, your, you know, your language, your culture is a bit different. It is. And they, just, they didn't want to end up back in another war. And I know some Holocaust survivors that ended up in Palestine, they did before, I think it was even Israel. And they all had to leave because they were just like, oh my God, it's a fucking war again. Okay, let's go back to Europe. So... That's why it's, how can I say, you know, people don't really understand that Israel, a lot of Israelis are descendants from refugees who just had no choice but to end up there. So really, you cannot blame a group of people for the actions of a really bad government, pretty much. And and that's what, because again, you know, it's, it's like if you'd be attacking random Chinese game developers, just because China is really awful. So... That's what. That's why I guess this game has suddenly become needed in the gaming industry, because you know before it's to educate about the Holocaust or those things, and it still is. But now I also believe it's a project to also educate people what hate and anti-Semitism can lead to, because so many people have forgotten that. Because so many people the thing similar to what they say now, is exactly what they were saying back then. Jews control the world. Those Zionists are doing this and that. Like. I personally, I don't know why I just hate the term Zionist. It just doesn't sound uh, that great. And, you know, you can make it sinister really quick. You yeah, yeah, it so. sounds. I mean, I, I remember hearing that word for the first time, especially with like fake, fake stuff like the protocols of the elders design and stuff like that. They're just yeah. like all of these very uh, negative connotations with it. But I always think uh, I met Israelis for the first time when I was in college. I went to school with some Israeli kids and, you know, the fear of living in a country where you have a compulsory military service and everyone is expected to fight and die if necessary. I mean, these, it's very South Korean in a sense. It's very scary. And I don't think people can understand that people don't live in those situations because they want to. People in South Korea don't live next to a nuclear nuclear armed psychopath because that is the way they want it. 
Yeah. You know, I, I, so I, I just, I agree. I think that that's a, a wonderful point as well. And I, I really hope that the games industry wakes up to a lot of the, the echoes of what I think you're saying are true. Like I really, I don't want to get too deep into it because I know a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people just don't want to hear it anymore. But I saw what I would consider blank blanket anti-Semitism emanating out of the games industry. Like you said earlier this year, like I I thought it was, I I mean, I thought it was as clear as day. I think a lot of people don't know it. A lot of people copy what they hear. It happens over and over again. Everyone's an expert now on Israel and Palestine. Never heard anyone say now they're an expert on Israel and Palestine, but I think they got caught up in the trope, the dangerous tropes that you're describing. And that's how people become dehumanized. And I was like really shocked that, that this was happening with, I was like the only person saying anything with like a huge platform in media, you know, in the other yeah. direction. I, I mean, it's, it's, if you look at, if you look at the tweets or the, what Neil Druckmann had posted last year when the last of us two was released and he, and he posted all the messages he got. And one message really stood out to me, which was basically you're a dirty Jew with no home, you dirty Israeli. And I'm like, that really st- stood, stood out to me. Cause it's like, yeah, most people ended up in Israel is because they had no home. And, and again, I would have liked it if the industry would have, I'm all for, so, so basically when everything was going on over there, I was like, let's elevate Palestinian and Israeli voices. Let's elevate those voices because they know what the fuck is going on over there. Even if say, you know, maybe some Palestinians might really hate Jews, but I'm like, I can, I can kind of understand that I can in a way. So, um, but then what was going on in the industry, like you said, it was everyone else who had no clue, had never been on the ground there, aren't Palestinian, talking about all things which they don't know anything about. And without bringing up the fact that in the Middle East and North Africa, they kicked out all their Jews. There's less than 12 Jews left in Egypt. If a Jewish man wants to marry another religion, he can't in Egypt. They kicked, everyone's gone kicked out. And I think that didn't the last Jew just leave Afghanistan? I read a story about that, right? The last Jew like left or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 He left Afghanistan, but he was God. He sounded like a Lie David episode. That guy, he did because he was. He, he, I don't know if you heard the story. He, um, he. There was another Jew. There used to be two Jews in Afghanistan, and they kept on fighting over the synagogue, and they kept on telling on each other. To the Taliban when they were in power Jeez. back in the day, the Taliban had enough, put them both in jail. Then they kept on fighting within the jail that the Taliban just let them go. Can you imagine the Taliban probably thought like, what the fuck are these guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like a Kirby enthusiasm uh, episode. But that's that's kind of really where I am because, again, being a non-Zarnist, I feel like Jews should be able to live in all these countries I do. And that's why it makes me incredibly sad you know everything that really happened and and again in the case because i know a lot of people take my words out of context i am for palestinian state i absolutely acknowledge what happened during um you know when israel palestine was founded and the amount of palestinian refugees and i know about all those things and it's fucking terrible and we have to figure out a way to fix that but i just personally refuse to demonize a group of people who are not responsible for that. It's the equivalent of me hating Germans now. Mm. Imagine if I just went around, all oh, you Germans are Nazis, you killed all the Jews, all your fault, even if you weren't born then. Right. And Sins of the father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. And so, so that's really what, you know, why I would not demonize any group uh, kind of ever. And I guess that's become controversial in the gaming industry. But what happened again this spring, it really has happened a lot behind the scenes too. So I know like a lot of gaming outlets. So the reason why I say, imagine something like um, Light and Darkness, I get a lot of, I get coverage basically on mainstream outlets I do, but not on gaming outlets. And there's also a big reason for that too. It's because basically being a Jew and also for some reason, you know, there's this rumor that I'm the most Zionist guy ever. So that kind of stop. But, you know, people are like, yeah. oh, don't want this Zionist. Fuck this Zionist. And I'm that, that's just how crazy it's kind of gotten in the I know. gaming industry. It has. It's a shame. It's a shame. I mean, I, I'm the uh, people take me out of context all the time, say horrible things about me and try to use people in my life as tools and pawns. And it's, it's all fucked up. And I think the games industry is is deeply broken in some way. I think um 
I think it's almost an honor for you to not get attention from those outlets because like for this particular project, it's like, I don't know, you don't, I've learned in my own experience with my own games and my own company that like, you don't really need them. And it sounds like you have something really fascinating here. I really want to play it. And I want to echo what you said too, Luke, which was, I am also for the two state solution. And I also, it's very similar to what Ron Paul, a great American politician I love used to say, which was like, can't you understand why like they're f- fighting and killing our soldiers in Iraq or in Afghanistan? I mean, can't, you have to kind of ask yourself the honest question. And so, yeah, of course, when violence begets violence, you can understand why the two sides hate each other. And uh, and my stance is just that if if Pal- if the Palestinian side just stopped, then so would the Israeli side. That I do think is true. But well, I understand I why people have these generations. You're, 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 the IDF co- comes over and kills your brother, right? Like, it doesn't yeah, matter yeah, well, why. Well, you don't well, care well, why, you know? Like, and, and what they do in the West Bank nonstop. I mean, the, the, I mean, I am all for, but again, I'm not Israeli, you know what I mean? Right. I, can't, I can't come in there and right. be like, that's what people don't understand. I can't come in there and be like, okay, now we're going to give Palestinians this and that. I have no... Yeah, American. they're conflating and, you as a Jew with a Zionist, with an Israeli, with a refugee, with a, and that's the point you're making is that you're just these are all verticals that don't necessarily go in the same silo with each other. You know, it's it's a very I can't wait to play this. I, I'm I'm excited to, to learn more. Yeah, please go on. There's actually a very interesting thing is that I've actually for this game I've actually had a lot of uh, Palestinian scholars reach out to me and tell me like this is a great project. Like I've actually, I'm not talking about young people. You're like, fuck, I hate all Jews kind of thing. I'm talking about scholars who know what they're talking about, who actually really hate Israel too. But, you know, they know not to enter racist territory. And they're really for this title. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. When you remove the extremists, right, you notice that people, you know, uh, how can I say, the real experts and everything are not hateful and again the super supportive of this thing i thought it's just something very interesting so you know the whole thing about palestinians and jews hating each other it's, it's just mostly americans making shit worse it is kind of thing well that I, seems to be the that seems to be our specialty in all things oh well, yeah i i have a comedian a friend who pretty much his roommate is palestinian so it, it it's really like it's really interesting but also what's been um interesting too because that again i believe this game to be educational in the sense they make people curious is that some of the older holocaust organizations who are run by older people don't get the video games that are educational yet that's that's also been kind of a bit of a challenge just with a few not all because the ones that have young people they can't get it right away and i think that that's an interesting conversation because it's like i i believe like we're not doing a good enough job in terms of educating about the Holocaust. And I think it's because organizations in general stick to old media where it's like, oh, it's just teaching classrooms. They just bring right. kids over to a museum. And let's be honest, when you're kidding, get sho- shoved inside the Holocaust museum, you're like, this is depressing. God, why am I here? I, you know, I imagine that's how kids are. And that's why I think a video game is more, how can I say, engrossing and you become more attached to the characters and you just i just think it's such video games are a platform which compared to movies and everything else where you can actually really be there you can and be a, really a lot more attached and that's why i think we need to tell more serious stories in video games no matter kind of what they are and also be able to tell stories you know which are even current and maybe a bit controversial too i mean there was there's been a lot of journalists which have been asking me, why don't you do a, a game about what's happening to Uyghurs? And I was like, yeah, I think I'll be banned by the entire gaming industry if I do that. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> they don't would. want to talk about any any of that any of that stuff, strangely or not so strangely. But um, yeah, I'm you know, I think about games like uh, Valiant Hearts and. How I think that game probably didn't sell gangbusters when Ubisoft released it, but I, I imagine that that was someone's many, probably many people's avenue, perhaps even their only avenue into World War One and like what it was like. And I think that to your point, you have to meet people where they are. Mm-hmm. And that's where they are. They're on video game consoles, they're on computers or on their phones, whatever the case might be. And so I'm really stoked about this, Luke. And 
Um, anything that we can do uh, at Last Stand to help you promote this game, we'll be ha very happy to do it. Um, so, you know, obviously we talk behind the scenes, but let me know whatever we can do. And of course, you should go and support Luca. So Arcade Distillery is your publisher, right? Is that so? So Arcade Distillery is one of my it's my company it is which i co-own and which we you know kind of did all those vita games uh pretty much with so cause i guess it's the development studio also for uh delight in the darkness but i just i wanted to kind of release i plan to release it under a different brand i do just because i think again because the voices are forgotten we kind of want to continue making kind of serious games we do kind of similar to delight in the darkness so Again, even with the name of the uh, nonprofit, Voices of the Forgotten, it's pretty much to give voice to those, you know, which society and history has kind of forgotten. And and that was one interesting thing, because I, I can reveal this. At the end of the game, in the credits, we actually plan to show the photos and names of the children of France that got deported, pretty much, because I always feel like, in terms of the Holocaust, we never talk much about the victims who they were what they did and all those things we you know it's, we just reduce them down to names and numbers you know six million dead these are all their names and i think we should be focusing more on people's who they were you know to kind of like get people to kind of understand because funny enough um there's one woman uh she goes she eva kokosh i can't pronounce her, her her Polish name, but she went from the pet uh, with the pen name Eve Adams. Eve Adams, pretty much, uh, she had one of the first lesbian bars in New York. She did, and she pretty much got kicked out by the FBI. I forgot who was at the FBI back then, you know, because she was a you know, lesbian bars not really allowed right. back then. She got kicked out and she ended up in France. She did, and then the Holocaust happened and she ended up dead. And to me, I was just like, that is an LGBTQ icon, but she's dead and no one knows her pretty much. I mean, the one of the first lesbian bars, like, and so there's so many stories like that of people who did so much for society, which we, you know, have forgotten. I mean, that that's one of the most tragic things I think about the Holocaust is that these 6 million people imagine all the things which they were doing for society making things better and now they just gone forever and it's not that long ago you know those people were basically our grandparents you know could have been our grandparents and you know so many families lost and i think that's one of the things which really stuck with me and, and why i personally just can't for, forget about this i can't even me personally i kind of want not justice but you know i I, I still don't think, you know, a lot of the things um, that we've done enough pretty much for everything, you know, everyone who's who's gone. We just, you know, literally forgotten about it. We have. It's, it, it's interesting, too. And I always think about this, too, like the the various snuffed out chains along the like of all, you know, the person who's who was killed and didn't have kids that didn't create something amazing, didn't do this, didn't do that, all the potential. That's mm -hmm. lost. That's the greatest that I, that I think is and, and the untold stories and maybe the untold horror that could have happened from from some of these people surviving to who the hell knows. I mean, but it is really interesting. And um, I love what you said about Voices of the Forgotten. Like it would be it would be interesting for you to return with another game. That's some other conflict like the Armenian genocide or something. I mean, that's an even more forgotten. I mean, Jesus Christ, that that's like that's oh. that's like a Holocaust <laughs> that's denied by the people that basically did it. I mean, that, that's I, incredible stuff, you know, so I would love for you to pursue that. Oh, day. I mean, I mean, genocide. Yeah, I mean, it's anytime I post about that on Twitter, you slow those people come straight up to deny it. And I notice that's what's happened with the Uyghurs pretty much. Anytime I talk about Uyghurs within the gaming industry, super, super, super liberal people will come right away and be like, I don't think it's a genocide or, you know, the sources aren't that right. And I'm just like have we entered like a mad world right now where yes. basically like what is kind of happening uh in terms of this i mean that that's what's become really weird nowadays it's just genocide denial has become so much on the rise and i really think again video games you know we're like a way to 
because funny enough, even with Delight in Darkness, I'm planning to translate it to so many different languages. So I'm planning to also translate it to Arabic and have it also distributed within like the MENA region and all that, where they don't really have access to much Holocaust education. So people can actually become curious about it. So my audience for that game, and I've always told people it's not Jews. I, I, I don't, Jews always know about all this. It's kind of everyone else mm. it is. And, and I think it's, you know, I, I do think it's something that could maybe help solve sometimes, you know, racism a bit as, as how can I say as, you know, far fetched as that is, you know, people, they just resonate more with stories they do when they get attached to characters. So, you know, maybe a kid who hates Jews a bit, you know, will play the game and just be like, well, they just like us. I don't understand why we hate them. And hopefully, you know, it, it can do some positive changes like that. So that's kind of what I'm kind of seeing with this game. And that's why I think it's, again, interesting that video game companies that claim to be so anti-racist and so, you know, for social justice, all those things are quote unquote scared of this game. It's, it's, it's very interesting because they sometimes some companies won't even want to take the call. They won't very much. Even if the ones who have gotten the call with, they get it, they get it right away after once I talk to them and then they're like, you know, excited for it it's 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 really weird it is it's 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 not lost on me i mean i'm paying close attention these days about which companies are kowtowing to general totalitarianism and which ones aren't and um it's strange that companies have no problem editing their games for you know like china just announced that they're going to start banning like same-sex relationships in video games and choice-based morality yeah, choice and choices it's like whoa man uh that seems pretty serious, but I, I like you. I, I'm, I would be especially intrigued to see if you can get the game out in like, you know, on, on the PSN in like Saudi Arabia or something like how, how it would do there, you know, and I'm, I'm excited to hear more and what we're going to remind our audience when uh, the time comes, like Luke said, it's um, Q2 2022, the light in the darkness, undetermined platforms, but we'll but it's, 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 it's console. I will say it will eventually come to all consoles, but right now, we're talking to some different manufacturers sure. for the first version because we want, you know, someone behind it to actually yeah, yeah. That's, get that it. That makes perfect sense. So, um, Luke, tell everyone where they can find you online if you want to be found. Oh, <laughs> easy. It's, it's Twitter. It's Luke Bernard, L-U-C, then Bernard. Okay, much. excellent. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, and uh, I'm wishing you the very best as you finish up this project. You're welcome back anytime. So just... Uh, let me thank know you. and and you're very welcome and, and thank you all out there for your love kindness and support of all things um sacred symbols plus we appreciate you we'll see you next time until then goodbye sacred symbols a playstation podcast is a product and trademark of last stand media and collins last stand llc and is proudly recorded in the usa the show is conceived by is written by and is directed by me colin moriarty my co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.